So I first watched Red, White, and Royal Blue when I was at a pretty bad place in my life, and it was in this miasma of anxiety that I was introduced to the love story of Alex and Henry, who are the son of the President of the United States and the younger Prince of England, respectively. The pop song needle drops in the movie were immaculate, and the doughy-eyed actor shared a bunch of longing glances, and while I wouldn't call it a great movie, it definitely does everything that it sets out to do. And also, spoiler warning for everything that happens in the movie, but also it's a cheesy romance, so you kind of already know what happens, don't you? Anyway, soon after, I learned there was a book and I read it in like two days flat. Because when you feel bad, it feels good to engross yourself in a story about the power of love. But something did strike me as a little strange when I was reading the book, because it delves a lot more into Alex's B story as a hopeful politician than the movie really does. A fair amount of the word count is dedicated to Alex's job as a campaign staffer for his mom's re-election, and Alex's mentorship with an older gay senator who joins the opposing campaign kind of as a diversity hire, but then saves the day by exposing the corruption of the Republican nominee, and about how the race is close, only made closer by Alex and Henry's scandal, and how the entire presidential election hangs on whether or not Texas will turn blue. And this weird feeling kind of crystallized when I realized that this book was kind of an alternate retelling of what would have happened if a Democratic senator from Texas won the presidency in 2016. And there was something about that that really irked me. Because not only is this a world where England shows up in droves for a gay prince, which, like, sure, that would be great, but this is also a world where a strongly principled good person wins the presidency. A campaign is successfully shut down when the public is exposed to blatant corruption on the part of the Republican nominee, and maybe most importantly for me, this is a world where a strong enough Democratic candidate actually flips Texas. And as we wade further into the murky, poisonous waters of another election year, where a presidential campaign is still going strong even though the nominee faces 91 felony counts, and Texas is making it illegal to even whisper the word abortion, I've sat with this story and realized to myself that what I think's throwing me is that it almost feels like utopian fiction. In the way that utopian fiction is a style of fiction that takes place in an idealized world and aligns with the author's greater ethos and personal philosophy. Because while Alex's America is flawed, good wins. Electoral colleges work effectively, campaigns mired in scandal fail, and a democratic president is just what we need to get things looking up for the little guy. And to many liberal people, that feels pretty utopian. So Alex, uh, the book's POV character, and I actually demographically have more in common than I think I might with any other fictional character. I know what it's like to be from a place that you love that seems to hate you. In the past, I also shared those same hopes that Texas would one day become a liberal state, but as the wheel of time keeps turning, it's starting to feel like a total pipe dream. And I think that's why it bugged me so much. Because since the president is not only an all-around good person, but she's also a saucy girl boss, she's not engaging in any kind of morally gray imperialism abroad. She's a Democrat, so she is a force for good. The story ends happily because she gets reelected, and everything is finally looking up because we have a good Democrat in office for the next four years. There are people who will tell you that elections don't matter. But try telling that to the auto worker in Michigan who worries whether or not their plant will be shut down. Tell that to the transgender high school student in Mississippi voting for the very first time. Elections do matter because they give you a voice. And your voice is blended tonight with the voices of millions of Americans just like you. Open-hearted, fearless, and alive to a bolder, brighter, braver future. Okay, I'm editing. Um, I'm just inserting this because um, I don't want to be misconstrued. While I feel like this clip best represented what I'm trying to say, I did want to clarify that I do think it is much better to have someone who seems to have at least a basic respect for marginalized people in office. I think that by framing a democratic president getting elected as like the answer to all of our problems, as like the ending to a happy movie, and this is literally like maybe the second to last scene, doesn't really speak to the fact that no matter what happens, this country does seem to be set up to value 
um, capital holders more than more than people, which is evidenced to me most clearly by the incredible wealth gap that has only been growing and that I think we all feel in how much groceries we can take home, in the wages that we're getting paid at our jobs. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that elections do matter and vote, <laughs> but also clearly they don't solve everything, do they? Okay, anyway, um, back to me. And while this frankly quite privileged view is definitely one that I used to share, it's safe to say it's not really an opinion I still hold. <laughs> So I guess my question is here, which I'm sure you're all eager to know, is there any use for this kind of alternate history? Okay, maybe I have multiple questions. Here's another. Is this story feeding into what I believe is a harmful narrative about good presidents, when in actuality every person making decisions for this country has, no matter their place on the political spectrum, furthered the interests of the American empire with little regard to people in the rest of the world, especially the global south? And if so, how bad is that? And in the interest of not irritating you, I'm gonna admit right now that I cannot give you a definite answer, but I do go on yapping for quite some time. So if that would annoy you, please feel free to click away. You are free to go watch Mr. Beast making his fellow human beings play Russian roulette, very dramatic, not clickbait at any time. But in order to think about my questions some more, I'm gonna compare the movie to a utopian story that I have a lot of experience with, which is Star Trek. Okay, so I know it's kind of a stretch because because Star Trek is clearly sci-fi and their society is much farther removed from ours than the one in Red, White, and Royal Blue. The similarities I'm drawing really start and end because in the Star Trek universe it also kind of feels like it just assumes that from where we are now things just keep getting better. But by doing so it also implies that we are on this ladder of progress. On our way up from color television and MLK having a dream all the way to a totally egalitarian galaxy-spanning human race. Implicitly, this also suggests the slightly more nefarious settler colonial narrative where American capitalism and the way things are will lead us forward in a kind of righteous manifest destiny across the stars. And for a liberal white person in the 60s, I'm sure it felt like things were just gonna keep getting better and better. You know, today, shared bus seats. Tomorrow, shared spaceships. And if you've ever seen those silly designs of what people thought technology might look like in the year 2000, it all seems silly now, but it was literally my grandparents' generation that if you were poor, you grew up without a TV or phone, and now you have a machine that washes your clothes for you. No one knew about global warming. Flying cars were next. So I'm just trying to say that all of that definitely feels a little more outlandish now than maybe it used to. Like Red, White, and Royal Blue, it's a little frustrating to me because it seems to ignore a lot of the world as it is in order to present an alternate future where everything worked out. Because, oh my god, Captain Kirk! How much fracking did we have to do to get the Enterprise's fuel? How much of Starfleet's CO2 emissions contribute to the melting of the ice caps? The polar bears, Captain! Think of the polar bears! Now that it feels like we might actually have to work out a lot of very real, very scary problems right here on Earth, does that mean that a frivolous, unrealistic story like Star Trek can't have a real place in our lives? So firstly, I just want to make sure that you know that I know that Star Trek was an adventure series first. And while its creators did believe in an equitable society, the main point of the show was to be fun. But it also asks, wouldn't it be nice if maybe different kinds of people could work together and no one had to get too upset about it? And the relationships Kirk had with a lot of the women characters are silly, to be sure. But women, for the most part, did really get to be a part of Starfleet's crew. And in the Mad Men days, that was better than most shows. The people of Starfleet really respected each other, firstly as co-workers, and then, if they considered each other close, as friends before anything else. And I also want to specifically shout out the character of Uhura, because a lot of the time when I think about the original series, I think about that Whoopi Goldberg quote, where the first time she saw that character, she shouted, Mom, come in here quick! There's a black woman on TV and she's not a maid. Because when Star Trek was coming out, that was rare. 
and it was special. Not to mention, she and Captain Kirk shared the first interracial kiss on TV, which was huge back then. In just presenting an equitable world, it helps the audience imagine what it might be like to live in one. And while it's not exactly the subversive media that I feel like a lot of people would have preferred, that aspect of it was great. And since Star Trek is set in such a distant future, it almost seems to use that setting as an excuse for its audience to imagine what might seem impossible today. So I've always loved the concept of Star Trek because it helps the viewer imagine a better world, but frankly is so goofy and far removed from how the world actually is today that the how we got there is just not as pressing. You can kind of forget about it and watch them try to pass off this dog as an alien and be like, well, they really went for it, didn't they? But let's get back to our gay romance. I think maybe it frustrated me where Star Trek doesn't, because it is so hard for me to imagine a future where a US president isn't implicated in some pretty dark shit. Especially because this story isn't science fiction. It's our world, but just a little different, because every president was the same up until right after Obama. So while Alex might one day stumble upon documents that implicate his mother in a fascist Nicaraguan coup, we're just kind of meant to not think that hard about what his mom actually does as president, and celebrate unequivocally when she wins another term. All that pesky US history makes it seem, to me, even more weirdly impossible than Star Trek, because it feels like it's trying to be more grounded so its shaky foundations are just that much more obvious. I don't really want to live in a future where the British monarchy accepts their gay son and lives happily ever after, because I don't really want to live in a future where the British monarchy still exists at all. But Abby, you might say, I think you're missing the entire point of the book. And honestly, I think I totally agree with you. I want to give this story the grace it deserves because it's not speculative fiction, it's romance. And I doubt the author thought anyone would care about the framing device for their romance enough to criticize it, let alone ramble about it online. And considering that this book seems to have been conceptualized in the late 2010s by a queer person, I can also kind of assume that the writer might just have wanted to imagine an alternate history that didn't make them sad. They wanted to write a love story about a prince and a diplomat, and they changed enough details to keep their book lighthearted and fun. That way, their protagonist could be a young, half-Hispanic, passionate, queer liberal and not, you know. And you know what? <laughs> it succeeds in that. It's a good book. It's a good love story. They're a good writer. And I'm a fool. And while I'm wondering if there's any use for utopian stories that don't start with a close reading of Marx and a total dismantling of settler colonial narratives starting at the beginning of recorded history, other people are reading their sappy romance novels and having fun on their days off. So does this book let American politicians off a little too easy? Yeah. I think it does. And if that irritates you, I think that's totally valid. But in my read, I also think that I was probably putting too much weight on the B story, because while the political intrigue does flesh out Alex's world, it's just a framing device for the love story, which is why we're all here. And in the love story, I think the book does an excellent job of showing us a future that is not just easy to imagine, but also possible to fight for. Because in our two main characters, Alex and Henry, we have young idealists who make a difference by choosing themselves and refusing to compromise who they are. And that brighter future Future exists most plainly when Alex and Henry are talking or falling in love or really just existing. I love when Alex and his dad talked about how some people must be so mad to imagine two Mexican guys with their feet up smoking cigars on a patio in the White House. I also like the little quips that Alex would make in his head. One of my favorites was that when he first made out with Henry, he laughed to himself because they were up against a portrait of Alexander Hamilton, and I thought that was just a really funny image. By choosing to love themselves, and by extension each other, they are dismantling dismantling the old order. Because they are gay, goddammit. They will be gay in the White House, and they will be gay in Buckingham Palace, and there isn't a damn thing Queen Victoria or George Washington can do about it, because they're both dead. And while maybe I can't easily imagine a future where any US president, having their heart weighed against a feather by the great Egyptian god Anubis, could successfully pass on into the afterlife, I can't imagine a future where we all work together to make old racist homophobes roll over in their graves. So, in conclusion, 
Uh, don't be like me. Take the positives from a positive book. Approximate the world you want to see with realistic actions you can take. When I think of dismantling the old order, my mind tends to go to the George Floyd protests. When people spray painted Confederate memorials, telling anyone who saw them that these people are not our heroes and we are going to create a future that includes us in spite of them. Obviously, I think these forms of protest are incredibly powerful and meaningful. However, However, in imagining a future like the one in Red, White, and Royal Blue, I think it could also be nice to find more fun, playful ways to be ourselves, in spite of the people who would have us not be. So go write fanfiction about gay, transoceanic romances between foreign dignitaries of all countries. If you're indigenous, go take a shit in Andrew Jackson's house. If you're gay, go make out on top of Reagan's grave, because that's a future that this book presents that's realistic and we can all get behind. Let's call our congressmen, let's try to dismantle systems of oppression through protest, through art, through anything that we can. But in our days off, let's just revel in being the people that George Washington never intended to be able to vote, because it is not Andrew Jackson or Ronald Reagan's world anymore. It's yours, because they are old and dead, and you're alive, so... Live your life and fuck them. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Um, if you didn't know that I was a snowflake before, um, you do now. This video assumes that basically you're a socialist. Um, and if you are, congrats. And if you aren't, I really encourage you to read A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. It will change your life. Anyway, I think that's all I have to say. Um, goodbye.